Data Skeptic mini-episodes provide high-level descriptions of key concepts related to data science and skepticism. Our topic for today is calculating feature importance. So I want to do a quick correction before we jump into this episode. Sean Law on Twitter reached out and said that apparently in the last mini-episode when we were talking about Random Forest, instead of saying that bagging meant bootstrap aggregation, which is the correct answer, I guess I said boosting aggregation. And boosting is something similar to bagging, but very different. And bagging absolutely relies on the bootstrap. So thank you for that correction. I think we'll talk about the bootstrap in a future episode, specifically a mini. So we'll get into it then and what the difference is. But for this week, I wanted to follow up a little bit on our random forest discussion from last time, Linda. Oh, yes. Yes. (laughs) We were talking about retail. Yes, and we were. Do you recall that a random forest model is made up of lots and lots of smaller decision tree models, individual models? Yep, yep. Trees make a forest, and you lump them into different forests, and then they vote. That's right. But now, what if you wanted to figure out which feature was the most important? Well, I don't know. You're going to tell me, right? (laughs) That's the whole point of this episode. So I thought maybe for this week we could discuss a different data set, one that's often used with Random Forest, and that's the Titanic data set. I don't think we've ever mentioned that before, actually. Do you know what that is? I'm assuming you mean the disaster. Yeah, the ship ship disaster, yeah. That hit the iceberg and tons of people died. That's right. And some people survived. So there's some researchers that put together a data set. I think it's based on historical data. I guess it could be fake, but I'm pretty sure it's real. And it has different information about all the passengers. Let me tell you what it's got. Can I just interject and say the Titanic movie clearly showed that people survived. (laughs) I'm glad we have James Cameron helping to educate us. (laughs) Yes. So we know for each passenger whether or not they survived. We know their class, because I guess there was first, second, and third class. Presumably first class is the best. We know their name, which really probably shouldn't be useful at all. We're more likely to overfit the data if we use the name. But who knows? Maybe, uh, I don't know, they discriminated against certain people, and we can figure out from their last name their nationality or something crazy like that. But most likely name is not useful. We know the sex of the person. We know their age. And for like each family, we know the number of parents and children on board. If you had to hypothesize a couple of different ways those variables might get used, how do you think, for example, the number of siblings might get used? I figure if you're a family with a lot of kids, they might have let you on the boats earlier. I think if you're a parent and the ship's going down, you're going to make that... I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel like I would knock my kid out if they were not willing to come. (laughs) Ah, so that's interesting. Yeah, like one of the things you might look at is whether or not having many children affected an adult's likelihood of survival. Yeah, that's true. Machine learning algorithms would do that sort of analysis for you. If that was in the data, it would naturally emerge. But it's still interesting to ponder what some of the models might pick up on. We also know the ticket number of the person, which you'd think would be useless, but maybe like people who bought their tickets early have an advantage or something like that. So that could be interesting. And then we know the fare price, how much they paid for it, as well as the type of cabin they have and where they got on, which port they boarded the ship at. Thinking about all those features, if you know those about every passenger, which ones do you think are the most informative if you had to just hypothesize? I guess age. Why is that? Well, because I think if you're elderly, you probably wouldn't have made it out in time. Mm -hmm. And then when you hit the cold water, Mm -hmm. unclear. And then, I mean, there were stories per the Titanic movie (laughs) that suggested that old people gave up their lives so that younger people could live. Actually, that's a really interesting case. So you kind of brought up two reasons. You said maybe an elderly person gave up their spot. And maybe a different elderly person was not able to get on the boats or survive being in the water. So those are two different reasons why that person might not have survived. They reached the same conclusion, but for different reasons. And that's the type of thing random forests and other ensembling type models are good for. One or maybe a set of trees might capture this altruistic behavior somehow. And then a different set of trees might capture the, you know, sort of enfeeble kind of thing you're talking about as well. What about gender? Do you think that is a strongly predictive feature? Well, I think women and men are are both strong and have lots of endurance, so no. Well, so this is not a commentary on the capabilities of anyone. It's just, it's a a, a model that tries to describe the reality of what actually happened at the thing. So I, I actually believe gender would have a big role in this because I've heard this expression, 
that they used they did women and children first under the boats. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's true, but if it is, then you'd expect women have a higher chance of survival. Right, right, yep. And children too, so then age would, would correlate there. Mm-hmm. All the trees would look over all these variables and come up with a, an ensemble model. While we're talking about it, what about the passenger fare? Do you think the price someone paid for their ticket's going to have an effect? So, I mean, that really depends on the map mm-hmm. of the Titanic and where the high class fares are and the cheap ones. Mm-hmm. And then also the impact of the ship. Like when it was sinking, did it sh- sink from the, like, the back, from the bottom, from mm-hmm. the middle, and which cabins were impacted? Because I think it was the middle of the night, so people were most likely sleeping. So mm-hmm. the people who got hit first probably didn't survive. <laughs> And then the ones who were on the second tier, third tier, whatever, the order of which it was sinking may have survived more. Yeah, totally. Now, do you think that's perfectly predictive? Did everyone on the lower decks certainly perish? I mean, I don't think so. I think the iceberg was like a slow thing. Like mm-hmm. they had like four hours. I, I mean, I don't know the exact time. Sure. But it was a big ship, so yeah. it didn't go down immediately. Well, even if it did... There's no guarantee that just because you were on the lower deck, you were in your room at the time, right? Maybe someone was up late having a, at a party or something, and th- that might increase their chances of survival. Although, being up late at a party is not one of the features we have available, so our model won't be able to capture that. But once you've trained your model and you've looked at its diagnostics, its accuracy, and all that sort of stuff, it might be good to try and inspect that model a little bit. Say, how is this working? Which features are important? You want to have some interpretability of your model. When you mean interpretability, what does that mean? Let's say you spend a good deal of time building a nice model, and then you go to some conference or something and say, hey, I'm good at predicting, or I have a model that explains why people did or did not survive the Titanic disaster. And someone will come up to you and say, well, how does it work? And if you say, well, I used random forest, they might say, I don't know what that is. Or they might say, well, that's nice, but how does your model actually work? Not what algorithm did you train it with, but what is it doing? When you feed it new inputs... How does it convolute those together into an output? But now we have a lot of trees, right? A forest of them. Do you think they all consider gender or maybe were some making good predictions without considering the gender? I think you can make good predictions without the gender, i.e. the sex. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I would say that we probably have a ton of models all taking a different approach. Maybe some focus on the fair, some focus on the cabin. Some focus on the combination of the sex and the age. We'll probably come up with a forest of very diverse models that all look at these features in different ways. For example, like maybe one model determines that if there's two parents on board and a young child, that it survives better than if there was only one parent on board with a small child. Mm -hmm. That could be like one corner case that a few of the models are able to process really well. So then if you said, well, how important is it to know the age? If every model uses age differently or not at all, how do you decide if it's important or not? Would you say which one was most statistically significant? It would be great to have a notion of statistical significance here, but there's no formal statistic involved. We kind of have to come up with a method. Oh, actually, here's a good corollary. I don't know what's a political topic going on right now. We're going to be voting on the president soon. Right, right. So what are some of the issues in the election? Republican or Democrat? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's good. Can we drill down? What about environment or something? Taxes is always a okay. big deal. What about net neutrality? Do you think that's important in the election? No. <laughs> Not at all. That's an important issue to me. Not important. Well, I'll agree. It's less important than taxes. But how do we know that? First of all, there's the media. Is the media talking mm-hmm. about it? But maybe if the media talks about it, they make it an issue. So it's like True. unclear there if it's important or just because the media is talking about it. I mean, obviously, you can make up a scenario where you go, oh, if Hillary believed X, Y, Z, would you vote for her? Ah, that's really interesting right there. Yeah. Make up these scenarios. Say, what if the candidate had a different position? What if Hillary flip-flopped her position on net neutrality? How many votes would that change? Would it sway the election? Net neutrality probably has some. Taxes probably has a lot for exactly your reason. If one or both of the candidates switched their position, it would change a lot of people's votes and therefore affect the outcome. So maybe we can take that same idea into machine learning. We built a nice model predicting the Titanic that uses age. What if we deleted age? What if we didn't have it? How would the model change? Could we still build as good of a model? What do you think? 
No. How much worse do you think it would be not considering the age? 50% worse. 50% worse. Okay, good. Uh, even though that's a very arbitrary number, that's a, a number of large magnitudes, so good instincts. What if instead of withholding the age, I withheld their ticket number? How much do you think that would affect the model you build? Here's the thing. I don't know if the ticket number correlates with their class. Oh, interesting. So if yeah. it correlates with their class, then it does. If it doesn't, they just gave out tickets random. The right. numbers are random in the order of which people bought them. Then maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah, my instinct would be to say it doesn't matter. Or if it matters, it probably matters very little. Because yes, that order might encode some other information. It might you know correlate with another value you could measure. But yeah, in general, the ticket number should be less important, or that's what we expect. So when we build these models, a lot of times we like to have a feature importance for a couple of reasons. One is to kind of validate your model. If you went and built a model to study the Titanic and you came back to me and said, Kyle, my most important feature is age, I'd be like, okay, yeah, that's plausible. If you came back and said, the most important feature is the name, I'd be like, well, that you've either overfit or you've done something wrong because name can't be the most important. It doesn't make sense. But even besides that, if you built a model that didn't have those sorts of intuitions, it's still important to know what are the features that the model is finding most useful because perhaps you want to focus on ways to better measure that feature in the future gender you can't measure anymore perfectly unless there was some human transcription error but if you were measuring like i don't know how healthy the person is and you had just like healthy unhealthy and that was really useful maybe you want to break that down into more categories or something like that so how do you do this feature importance well you do it analogously to the way you kind of invented about changing hillary's vote or changing trump's vote or something like that take a feature out and does it hurt the accuracy or you can look at take a feature out and see how it affects the Gini coefficients of the trees. So tell me, is the Gini coefficient related to a Gini in a bottle? <laughs> well, a good question, seeing as how I haven't introduced the Gini coefficient, but that we will leave for a topic for uh, future episodes because it's a good topic in and of itself. That's what Kyle says when he doesn't know what it means. <laughs> I know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> it's a he lot. doesn't. He's going to wait for someone to tweet him what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit like entropy, which we'll also talk about. So uh, we came up with a couple of future topics, Gini coefficients, boosting and uh, entropy, which might be the same as Gini. So stay tuned for those in the future. And thanks as always for joining me, Linda. Thank you. So if anyone listening is not on our Data Skeptic Slack channel and you'd like to join, I'd encourage it. Shoot me an email to kyle at dataskeptic.com and I'll send you over an invite. We're not just using it for the Open House Project anymore. Of course, that's still there and we're glad to have anyone who wants to volunteer as that expands. But there's going to be some new announcements in the near future about other stuff that's going to be going on in our Slack channel. So email me to get signed up. And until next time, I just want to remind everyone to keep thinking skeptically of and with data. For more on this episode, visit dataskeptic.com. If you enjoyed the show, please give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher.